Thank you, Professor. You can start now. All right. So, yeah, for the last lecture, I decided to just talk about my most recent work. So I will do slides today. You know, what I really wanted to cover was fluctuation theorem and thermodynamic and relation. Since this is done, I guess I can talk about my most recent work. And you, know, you should be able to understand most of it given the lectures. Okay. Okay, so I'll talk about two different topics. One is the cost of precise biochemical oscillation. So that's something I've been working on biochemical oscillations maybe for five years now. <clears throat> and the other thing I'm gonna talk about is active heat engines, which is something I just started working. Okay, so again, there will be two parts in this talk. First, I'll talk about uh, the free energy cost of biochemical oscillations. And you know, here I'm gonna find a, a relation similar to the thermodynamic center relation in the sense of telling what's the minimal cost for a certain precision. But the precision here for a biochemical oscillation is gonna be a different quantity as compared to, to the thermodynamic center relation. It's not the epsilon square I had in the thermodynamic center relation, but it's gonna be something else. It's gonna be the number of coherent oscillations, which I'm gonna explain what it is later. <clears throat> and the second part of the talk is second law for active heat engines. Now, you know, an active heat engine is simply an engine and, and the medium, is, instead of being a standard equilibrium reservoir, it's a reservoir made of, if you want to use this name, active matter, okay? So active is kind of a dangerous word in the sense that, you know, for example, the word non-equilibrium can be defined with an equation. <laughs> But active is not really a word that can be defined with an equation. It's, you know, sometimes it's a synonym of non-equilibrium, sometimes it's not. But here, you know, at least when I call a heat engine active, I will be able to define it with an equation, at least in this context, okay? Okay, so let me start with biochemical oscillation. So what's a biochemical oscillation? Well, I mean, the, the most maybe famous one would be circadian cycles. Those are 24-hour cycles that, you know, lots of animals have. So, you know, you don't want to, when it's night, you, you your body kind of want to enter a mode of let's sleep. And when it's morning, your body want to enter a mode, let's wake up. And, you know, we have some sort of circadian cycles within ourselves that they are like clocks that tell us the time, okay? So even if I take you and put you in a dark room, you know, you should be able to remember at least for a few days, your I mean, at some point, of course, your circadian clock is going to be destroy it but you know you're probably going to keep oscillating with these night and day cycles even if you're in a dark room without an exposure to light okay so you know there are many kinds of different models for oscillations and you know if you put a person in a dark room at some point the oscillations will lose coherence okay but now imagine a stochastic person by a stochastic person i mean i don't know a person made of a thousand molecules so it doesn't have to be a person just a system of chemical reactions, okay? And, you know, there are experiments you can do where you just have a bunch of chemicals and they will oscillate with a 24 hour period. The most famous thing that does that is called CHI-C, okay? Which is a molecule that you find in cyanobacteria. And, you know, if people do experiments of, of, with CHI-C, which they just put a bunch of CHI-C with together with other molecules, which are called CHI-A and CHI-B. And if you put all these things in a solution, the phosphorylation level of KIC we oscillate with a 24 hour period, okay? And again, these oscillations are happening without any external input, okay? There is no external world signal oscillating with a 24 hours uh, period, okay? And if the system is stochastic, okay, if it's made of a finite number of molecules, maybe a hundred, a thousand, um, then uh, if you look at the time series, it's gonna look like that, so, you know, there will be some uncertainty in the period of oscillation. There is also uncertainty in the amplitude, but that doesn't matter too much. The uncertainty of the period of oscillation, which means that, you know, if I was to run two different time series, after a certain number of periods, they are gonna dephase, okay? So maybe, you know, 
if I go long enough, one series is going to be a period of 1,000, the other is at a period of 1,200, and they are completely defaced, okay? From the perspective of one stochastic thing, it's already like a year. From the perspective of the other one, it's already a year and a half or, or something like that, okay? And the way to kind of quantify the precision of these oscillations is you look at a correlation function, and by that, I mean, you just do many different trajectories, you sum all of them, you're going to get the correlation function. And when you look at the correlation function, what you see is you see the thing oscillating and you see exponential decay of the amplitude of the oscillation, okay? And this exponential decay is because of fluctuations in the period of oscillation, okay? And the number of coherent oscillations is defined as decay time divided by the period, okay? The larger this number, uh, the longer uh, maintaining the coherence of the oscillations, okay? If, if, you know, if this number is 10, and I am at oscillation 100, then probably two different time series are going to be completely defaced from each other. One is going to be at 100, that's going to be maybe at 120 or something like that, okay? So, you know, and that's a particular model, it's called activator inhibitor model. But, you know, that's that's a biochemical oscillation, okay? Um, imagine a biochemical oscillation that does not have any influence, that there is no external signal from it. And the question I'm asking here, concerns the precision of these oscillations as quantified by the number of coherent oscillations, which is just the decay time of the oscillations divided by the period, okay? So that's the oscillate, those are the biochemical oscillations and, and, and that's the precision of the oscillation. Again, we saw the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. This quantity here, the number of coherent oscillations is mathematically completely different from the epsilon square, okay? So, you know, the thermodynamic uncertainty relation will not really help me here, okay. So, I mean, um, this is the definition of the activator inhibitor model. Now, you know, we saw this single enzyme model in the, in the lecture. Now, this is not a single enzyme, okay? That's a cycle of just one enzyme, but the idea is that there are many of these enzymes M in the solution, and there are all these chemical reactions, okay? And, you know, these quantities, I mean, the quantity, for example, that oscillates here is going to be X, okay? So, you know, when I'm looking at the oscillations there, I'm looking at the oscillations of the average concentration of X, okay? Not the average concentration, the concentration of X. The average one is on the right, the single trajectory one is on the left, okay? But, you know, this is a, it's a fairly more complicated model than the single enzyme model we had before. It's, you know, there are many, many, many states and there are many, many cycles. It's even hard to try to visualize the network of states. It's a much more complicated thing, okay? And so the question I'm gonna ask is the following. So that, let's say you give me a biochemical oscillator and the oscillator can oscillate for a certain number of coherent oscillations. Let's say the number of coherent oscillations is 10 or 100, okay? The question is how much free energy I have to pay to have an oscillator that oscillates from with a certain number of coherent oscillations, okay? That's the kind of question I'd like to ask. It's similar to the kind of question you ask in the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, but again, it's very different because it's a very different mathematical problem, okay? Um, if the system is in equilibrium, okay, there will be no oscillation, okay? It's impossible to have oscillations if you're in equilibrium, one can prove that. So, you know, in order to have oscillations, I must be out of equilibrium, but again, I wanna ask a more complicated question, which is what is the price of having a certain precision or a certain number of coherent oscillations when I look at biochemical oscillations. And, you know, we started working this problem five years ago, maybe. And, you know, we were motivated by the thermodynamic concentration relation in a sense. We kind of wanted to find an application where this, this precision was relevant. <coughs> what we discovered was that the precision for the thermodynamic concentration relation was not really the relevant quantity to look at, but rather this number of coherent oscillations. Okay, okay so, Again, that's the activator inhibitor model. And if you give me this model, I can write the master equation for it. So you're not supposed to understand this equation, okay? All I'm saying is, you know, if I want to determine the state of the system, I have to determine all these numbers here. One, two, three, four, five, six numbers. First. They will determine me the state of the system. And if I want to write down the master equation for this model, it's going to be this thing here, okay? It's a complicated master equation. You cannot really solve it exactly. It doesn't really matter. The point I want to make here is the following. If you give me a system, I mean, if there is a biochemical oscillation, there must be a system of biochemical reactions. If you give me a system of biochemical reactions, I can just go ahead and write down 
a master equation for this thing, okay? Which is the master equation we saw before. But again, that's an example of a fairly complicated master equation, okay? So um, if that's the case, then if I want to prove some bound uh, for the number of coordinate oscillations, now I want to try to to express this idea in a very general mathematical way, or the most possible general mathematical way I can, okay? And the idea is you give me a system of biochemical reactions like this one, I can tell you, uh, I, can I, can, I can write, I can simply go ahead and write down the master equation, okay? Okay, so, so if I can write down the master equation, which you saw in this lecture, I called it W here, it's called L, the, those are the transition rates. And you know, we saw this matrix. Um, there will be a formal solution to this equation, which is given by that, okay? And then I can calculate the eigenvalues values of this matrix L. Now, the first eigenvalue value is gonna be the eigenvalue value zero that gives me the stationary state, okay? That's, that's, that we all know. Now, the first, the second eigenvalue, value, which is the first non-trivial one, so it's the first non-zero eigenvalue, value, is gonna have a real part and an imaginary part, okay? And of course, you know, if the other eigenvalues values uh, have an even uh, bigger, in modulus real part. So the modulus of the next one is bigger, then it means that the decay time for the next thing in value is much higher. So all I have to worry about if I want to know what's the decay time of the oscillations is the decay time of this eigenvalue value and the imaginary part of this eigenvalue. value. Okay. So the period of the oscillations is going to be given by the inverse of the imaginary part of the eigenvalue value multiplied by two pi. And the decay time is going to be the real part of the Ingen value, okay? So basically, and you know, the number of current oscillations is simply gonna be this ratio here, xi divided by two pi xr. So that, I mean, it took us some time to really uh, realize that, okay? But basically, if you if I look at the problem of, of biochemical oscillations, the mathematical way to quantify this number of current oscillations is, I have to look at the ratio of imaginary and real part of the first excited Ingen value of the stochastic matrix, okay? And trying to find the minimal cost of coordinate oscillations will be like trying to find a bound on this uh, on this ratio of the imaginary part and the real part of the first excited gain value, okay? Okay, so that's the mathematical problem again. The idea is you give me a system of chemical reaction, I can write down a master equation. So the only assumption I'm making here is one that, uh, <clears throat> that um, any chemical, I'm, I'm thinking about chemical reactions that can be expressed in Markov process, which, you know, is pretty much most of them. And the second assumption now is that I can characterize the number of coordinate oscillations by the first again value. And that should be true for pretty much almost all models around. Unless something very strange happens, then you would have to go maybe to the next thing in value, but you know, the bound, the bound would probably be true also for the next thing in value. By that, I mean like lambda three, but those are pretty uh, good assumptions that should be true for a very broad range of systems, okay? Okay, so, okay, no, now uh, that is, I told you about the precision, which is the number of coordinate oscillations. Now, how do you characterize the cost? Well, the cost is by the entropy production, is characterized by the entropy production, okay, that we saw in this lecture. PI being the stationary state probability distribution, KIJ, is uh, the transition rate from i to j. And so that's the formula you see in the lecture with w's instead of k's. But you know, whenever I do chemical reactions, I like to use k for transition rate because you know people in chemistry often use the letter k for transition rates. Um, and you know, sigma is entropy production rate. So it's a quantity with unit one. It's a quantity with unit time to the power of minus one. In order to make this quantity dimensionless, I multiply sigma by two pi lambda i minus one, which is one period of oscillation, okay? So this delta S here is how much entropy is produced per period of oscillation, okay? It's a quantity, now it does not have dimension of time to the power of minus one anymore, okay? And it quantifies, uh, it quantifies the cost. And the bound we have found is that Delta S must be larger than four pi square N, okay? So that's the bound we found. Again, N is the, it's a dimensionless quantity, okay? It's just the number of current oscillations. Delta S uh, 
as dimension of entropy, but it's also a dimensionless quantity in the sense that it does not have dimension of time, okay, because I've multiplied by the period of oscillation. So delta S is how much entropy the system produces in one period of oscillation, okay, of this biochemical oscillation. And that's the bound we found. Okay, I'm going to try to explain how we found it. It's still a conjecture. We can't really prove this. It's a very hard mathematical problem. But basically what this relation tells me is that, for example, if I want to have 10 coherent oscillations, so if I have n equals to 10, then I must have 4 pi squared multiplied by 10 free energy consumed per period of oscillation. Okay, so I must consume at least 395 kBT if I want to have 10 coherent oscillations. Okay, and if it was 100, it would be 3,950 kBT, okay? So this bound here tells me what's the cost of precision. So it's similar to the thermodynamic center relation, but for a different quantity. It's not the precision of a current anymore. This is the precision of a biochemical oscillation, okay? And you know, the precision of a current won't be able to really tell much about the precision of a biochemical oscillation. Okay? That's what kind of we learned when we studied these models. Okay, now there is a caveat here. The caveat is this, if the number of current oscillations is, is is smaller than two pi to the power of minus one, not larger, okay? The bound can be violated if n is smaller than this number. So so that that is a really, really low number of current oscillations, okay? So, you know, if I was looking at a figure like this one, and the number of current oscillations is 0 0.1, I won't be able to see any oscillations, okay? Neither in the correlation function nor in the concentration, but, you know, if I was able to calculate like the end game value thing, then, I can probably see this number, okay? But if the number of current oscillations is below this thing, the, the bound can be violated only in this very peculiar regime. Again, that's only something I'll be able to see if I can calculate this again value. If I, if I cannot, if I'm just doing simulations and I look at uh, the correlation function, I mean, if the oscillation number, number of current oscillations is 0 0.1, basically I don't see any oscillation, okay? So the bound can be violated. It is an important mathematical property, but physically speaking, it doesn't really matter in the sense that, you know, for any visible sort of thing, anything that you could really see and consider an oscillation, really, this bound will be true, okay? It can only be violated in this peculiar regime, okay? Now, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll try to explain to you how did you get this bound, okay? Uh, but, you know, I guess you understand what the result is. The result is uh, if you want coherence in your uh, biochemical oscillations, you must be willing to pay a certain price per period of oscillation, okay? Which is, you know, again, if it's 10 coherent oscillations, you must pay 395 kBT per oscillation. Okay. Okay, so uh, Sorry. what? what Sorry. Yes, question. Uh, sure. You, in your, uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you can you repeat uh, once more? Uh, what is a non-trivial eigenvalue? Is it like the first, uh, is it a complex one? Uh, how do you order them uh, with the maximum so uh, the first, real value or real part? The, the first uh, non-trivial eigenvalue is the one with the modulus of the real part is the smallest one. So first I start with zero, then I just, I just look at my real part. I don't look at the imaginary part. And the smallest modulus of the real part is the first exciting eigenvalue. That gives me my my longer decay time, right? The smaller the XR, the larger the decay time. So yeah, I'm worried only about my large decay time. All right. And there is a lambda two, so this this one. And the lambda one, what is it? Lambda one is zero. That's the one that will put me in the stationary state, right? The maximum in value of the stochastic matrix ah, is zero. But on the next slide, there is a lambda something. It's not lambda two. Like uh, Lambda in the expression of the entropy uh, uh, production per oscillation. What is this lambda? Oh, that that's the imaginary part of the in value. That's this lambda here. Oh, sorry. Right. That right. that's the xi. That's my bad. Yeah. Thank I you. should have I should I should have said xi. Thank you. Yeah, lambda is the imaginary part of the in value. Sorry. Okay, so uh, now I just wanna try to explain how did we get this bound. So mm -hmm. what we did is the following. So suppose you do a unicyclic network, that means I just have a single cycle, okay? The network has omega states. Now we had saw, we have seen what an affinity is, right? An affinity is the product of the transition rates in the forward direction 
divided by the product transition rates in the backward direction. And I take the ln of that. And again, when I mean a unicycle, I just mean a unicycle with periodic boundary conditions. So when I arrive at omega, if i is equal to omega, i plus one is going to be equal to one, okay? And, you know, let's say I choose uniform rates. So I just say that chi, k of i to i plus one is going to be k e to the power of a omega and k of i, i minus one is equal to k. If I do that, I can calculate everything. I can calculate the delta s u r that we had before. I can also calculate the number of coordinate oscillations, okay? And for this case of uniform rates in a unicyclic network, I can find an expression for the delta s of the network as a function of n and omega, okay? If I use these two expressions here, I can calculate delta s as a function of n. Now, in general, of course, finding delta s as a function of n, which is what I want, right? I want to know what's the minimal delta s I must have for a certain n. It's like, it, it, it's a very hard mathematical problem, okay? Because both delta s and n are quantities that are hard to calculate. They are functions of the transition rate, but they are very hard to calculate, okay? So to calculate then, I, for example, have to calculate the first exciting n value, which is something that you can, even, even in a unicyclic network, you cannot calculate that exactly, okay? So it's quite hard to calculate. So you have to resort to some sort of numerical technique to try to conjecture the bound, okay? Okay, so what we do is the following. We are going to do a numerical minimization process, which is we fix the n. So let's say we tell our computer to fix the ratio of lambda i or lambda r, and then make a numerical search with this thing fixed, okay, uh, to what's the minimal value of delta s, okay? And I mean, this sort of uniform rate for a unicyclic model is kind of our guess or where the optimal thing should be, okay? Our guess is that our optimal thing is going to be around this value, okay? And, you know, that is this expression here in the limit of omega going to infinity, I get this thing on the right-hand side. So again, this is an uh, increasing function of omega. And if I take omega to infinity, I get 4 pi n. So basically, if I have uniform rates, I can either write down this expression that depends on n and it depends on omega, on the number of states. And if I take the limit of infinite states, I'll get 4 pi square n, okay? And now, you know, this is pretty much the best guess you can make or where the optimal is going to be. And we are going to test whether the optimal is going to be in this case. And what we do numerically, again, is you fix the n and you vary the delta s. It's actually easier to fix the delta s and vary the n. So typically, it would be easier to fix delta s, okay, the entropy production, and then try to maximize your n with that given entropy production. But again, <clears throat> those are not things that are easy to calculate, okay? They are, again, this is something you can only do numerically. I would have no idea on how to do this analytically. And so, you know, we can do it for different system sizes, omega equals to four, five, six, seven. And we kind of see a tendency. We see that if N is large enough, then, you know, the dotted line is the delta S U R that we had before, okay? And we see that the optimal and the, the, the dots, the, the points are the optimal we will obtain with this unicyclic network, okay? So, you know, if we optimize numerically the dots, they will start agreeing with the line only if the n is small, they do not agree. And actually the, the blue crosses that you're gonna that you see here, the blue plus sign that you are seeing here, it's also an optimization process, but now it's not a unicyclic network, it would be like a totally general network, okay? It's a fully connected network. And see, if I make a transition rate in a fully connected network equals to zero, I get a different network. So when I say fully connected network, that would include all possible networks with size four, five, six, and seven, okay? So we learned two things from these figures here. One is if I do the optimization process with a fully connected network or with a unicyclic network, I get the exact same result, which is very helpful because now I know that I don't have to talk about fully connected networks. I can simply reduce the problem that I'm trying to solve to unicyclic networks, okay? The second thing we learned is that the bound seems to saturate in the regime of large n, but if n is small, then, uh, then I can go below this, what I get for uniform rates, okay? And now from this figure, from the fact that uh, the optimal of a unicyclic network coincides with the optimal of a fully connected network, which again includes all possible connectors up to that system size, we were able to do eight, we were able to do a little bit larger system sizes. The problem is when you do the optimization fully connected network, you know, like by nine or 10, things start to become very hard. But 
Now, based on this result, the conjecture now is that we can reduce our search to unicyclic networks. Okay, we don't really have to care about fully connected networks because they will not be able to do better than the unicyclic one. So, you know, the unicyclic is already the best thing you can do. And so if you reduce unicyclic networks, then you can do very large system sizes, okay? So the color pattern you see is the system size that goes up to 55, okay? And, you know, if you see the, the different lines, it's increasing system size, okay? Uh, if you look at this, uh, this red line here, it's like an interpolating curve that you got as a limit of all the different curves you got for the different system sizes. And you see at the point where n is two pi minus one, if n is smaller than two pi minus one, then the bound is violated. So, you know, I'm able to get a certain number of quantum oscillations with less than four pi square n. But if it is larger than this number, then clearly the bound is going to be saturated exactly at four pi square n, okay? So, you know, this sort of uniform rates case in a unicycle network is going to be the optimal case if I am above a certain number. So that's pretty much how we have conjecture this bound and uh, a sort of um, proof of this bound remains an open challenge. And it's it's a quite hard challenge because, you know, it's it's like a, it's like a problem where you use like Lagrange like multipliers. It's the optimization of a function with a certain constraint. The problem here is both the function is something that you cannot really calculate exactly and the constraint to impose is also something that cannot calculate exactly. Both things are not things that in general you can calculate analytically. Okay, so that's why it's kind of a hard problem. So calculating n and delta s, both of them are non-analytical objects, let's say, and you know, apart from doing numerics. But you know, this numerics is pretty convincing. We are pretty sure this thing should work, and you know, that's what the bound is. So you know, you, you can test this against a real system. So. This is a model for chi -C. It's a very complicated model. I'm not going to explain it here. We did this model in this paper some time ago. But what we did is we took the data from the model, okay, that we had done in 2018. And then we just put the data, the delta S is a function of n for this model. You know, omega here is the system size of the model. So system size here simply means the number of chi -C I would have in solution, in the solution. And the dotted line is the bound, okay? So, you know, as, as, as the system size becomes bigger, it seems that the model goes a little bit further from the bound. For 10 chi C, it's kind of closer. I don't know if this is general though, you know, there could be a model that stays closer to the bound, the other one stays far away. I really don't know. All, all we can see here is that even if you do a more complicated model, uh, you know, clearly the bound, the bound is fulfilled and this more complicated model, which is close to what, you know, this is a model for Chi-C, really that is inspired by the experimental system from Chi-C. So it's, you know, uh, let's say a real model. It's not just a unicycle or a simple Markov network. And, you know, things, the bound is true, even if you do a more complicated model. That's what you can conclude. You cannot conclude anything about uh, system size, because again, that might be model dependent. We don't know. Okay, so, uh, with this slide, I finished the part on the free energy cost of um, biochemical oscillations. I don't know if there anybody wants to ask me questions about that. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so the non-zero non imaginary part of the first non-trivial eigenvalue is the key for having non-trivial entropy production, right? So which pushes further to this inequality. Uh, I, I mean, the, the imaginary part has no influence in the interproduction. The, the imaginary part is what make you have oscillations. If, if there is no imaginary part, there are no oscillations. If there is an imaginary part, then there is there a are larger, yeah. yeah, but larger imaginary part of the eigenvalue, you, know, you have a, low, a larger lower bound, right? Because of N. Well, the, 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 the smaller the, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, there is an interplay between the imaginary part and the real part, right? It depends. I mean, it's not only about the imaginary part. You have to compare both of them if you want to calculate them. So n is, is a comparison between both, right? You you want okay, your period yeah, to yeah, be smaller yeah. than your decay time. I mean, it doesn't really, but it's not only about, it's about both of them. So n again is dimensionless, okay? It's not, doesn't have dimension of time. I see, okay. But anyway, so could you offer some intuition uh, behind this inequality? Why this one should hold? 
I mean, not really. So the, well, the inequality, physically, it's just the minimal price. I mean, if you're in equilibrium, you cannot have oscillation. So you must be out of equilibrium to have oscillations. And so basically the natural question is, is there a minimal cost, cost to get a certain number of quantum oscillations? And in the end, there is one. At least if it's large enough, there is one. You see, if, if it is smaller, if you're at a very low end, then you could get at a very, very low cost. But at a higher end, there is a minimal cost to it. So that's kind of the physical idea. But why is like that or... I mean, very hard to have any intuition. It's again, it's a very complicated mathematical problem. I mean, we cannot really do anything analytically. And I mean, you, you know, you can you can say, for example, that it's intuitive that uh, I mean, let's if it's intuitive that you know, basically the bound is saturated at the at the, at a unicyclic network with uniform rates. Okay, and if you only think about precision, that is sort of intuitive. Okay, because if you just have a single cycle in a network, okay. The best thing you can do is to just do that cycle, okay? I mean, it's better to just have a single cycle that you do that to have a network with many, many different cycles. And, you know, if in a more complicated network of states, you have many, many different cycles. And what you want to do is to just do your best cycle all the time, okay? So it's kind of intuitive that you should just have a single cycle. But, I mean, again, that's intuitive for the case of if I'm only looking at precision, okay? So, you know, that the most precise thing should be a unicycle thing, it's intuitive. But now when I also add the cost to it, uh, when I think about not only the precision, but the interplay between precision and cost, then things are not so intuitive anymore because, I mean, a multi-cyclic network can have, can have cycles that actually decrease the interproduction and it's not obvious that, you know, when I'm looking at the interplay between delta S and N, that a unicycle should uh, be the, the bound. And it is not, if, if N is small enough, it is not anymore. So the sort of nonlinear regime, although from a physical perspective, it's not so important because the number of oscillations is too low, but if you want to think about a mathematical understanding of the bound, and, and, you know, it's kind of important because the bound is not saturated at a unicycle for, or at a unicycle with uniform rates for low enough n, okay. So, but I don't, I don't have much further intuition about the bound. It's a kind of complicated mathematical problem. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Andre, I have one short question. So, the another way of computing the, the quality of an oscillator is the quality factor. You do a um, power spectrum density, and you get the peak frequency and the and the width. So is it possible to write this type of bounds in terms of quality factor? Yeah, sometimes people also call this, I guess so, I guess, because I guess the peak, I mean, the peak, the peak is gonna be, the peak of the Fourier transform is gonna be exactly corresponding to the frequency of the oscillation, which is two pi over the period, right? And so I don't know how exactly you define the quality factor, from the Fourier transform, but they might be exactly the same quantity, I would guess. They might be exactly the same quantity, okay. I guess. This quality factor that you get from the Fourier transform, because basically, I mean, you, you have the size of the peak of the Fourier transform, uh, which I guess is not going to really be related to the decay time. That would be different, but I also don't think that's going to be your, but you know, the place where, where your peak is, is exactly the, the whatever is the, my period of oscillation. And I don't know how you deduce what's the decay time from the Fourier transform, but I, I would guess they are more or less the same quantity. Okay, okay. there was a question. Uh, yes, it's more or less related to what you asked, uh, because I'm more familiar with the spectra. Uh, but, so I was uh, wondering about the basic of the model. Um, the, the eigenvalues are eigenvalues of the L operator in the, yeah. the equation, right? Okay. Yeah. Because uh, you was uh, showing at the beginning the difference between uh, the, the time series and the correlation of the time series. So these eigenvalues are not about the decay time in the time series, right? It's in, in the correlation function. Yeah, I mean, there is no decay time in the time series. The time series oscillates forever. So there is not a yes. decay time. Okay. The, this decay time is related to the fact that if I look at two different time series, that peaks start to, the, the periods where they oscillate start to dephase. That's what the decay time relates to. So to see the decay time, I must do a, I must do an average. I must do correlation function. Okay. So I think uh, the thing uh, with uh, which I'm not very familiar is 
uh, y uh, is the are the l uh, eigenvalues the eigenvalues of the l operator related to the correlation function of the of the time series okay so any any correlation function so okay so that that's my master equation right so any correlation function is going to be a linear combination of this p of t here so let's say i look at pi of t okay so pretty much any correlation function you can imagine is going to be a linear correlation of pi of t okay that's something you can prove it's not so hard to do it but you know we may, if you think about correlation function that's a function of time that can be written as a linear combination of the probability to be in the state of time. So basically correlation function is, I have some initial condition and I look at the probability to be at time t given that initial condition. That's what the correlation function is, a time correlation function. And so this probability of time is gonna, is gonna be the exponential of L t multiplied by P of t. And you know of course the dominating and value by that, I mean the first non-trivial one, the one with the, with the largest decay time is the one that's going to dominate because all other ring and values are going to have shorter decay times and they all the all these all the imaginary parts that they have are going to disappear because of the decay time is shorter you know they might have an influence if you do like a Fourier transform you might see a, a smaller peak corresponding to these other imaginary parts of other ring and values but their decay time is shorter so they just their effects disappear faster is that clear Thank you, that's it. Uh, are there any more questions? Okay, so can continue with the... Yeah, you can continue with the... Okay, so that was one problem that we have been working with. Uh, the other problem is about heat engines. That's a more recent one, or as, I mean, both papers are from this year. So, uh, I can close this. Okay. So, okay. So let me, I will start telling you about the history of heat engines. And again, when I say a heat engine here, I mean a periodically driven system. Okay. So, you know, we see in, in, in this course I gave, I only talked about steady states. Okay. Here it's not a steady state anymore. It is the case where my transition rates, they would depend on time and they would be periodic in time. Okay. Why are they periodic in time? Because I have things like temperature and energy vary periodically in time. If they vary periodically in time, then the transition rates of a discrete model must also vary periodically in time, okay? So just so that you situate with the letter, with the lectures. Now I'm gonna talk about periodically driven engines, like, you know, those were the engines that were the backbone of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics basically started with people thinking about this kind of periodic heat engines. And I'm gonna talk about that again, from what you seen, from what you saw in the course, the difference is that the master equation would have transition rates that are periodic in time, okay? Which is no mathematically a little bit more difficult than finding the stationary state, but it, it's, it's something that can be worked out also. Okay, so let me tell you the history of heat engines in stochastic thermodynamics. So, you know, this might be the prototypical model for it. That's like a colloidal particle in an harmonic potential. So what you do here is first you you change the you change the stiffness of the potential. That would be something similar to increasing the volume in the steely engine, right? Because you know the particle in this potential is more confined and the particle in this potential here is less confined, right? So if I if I increase the stiffness of the potential, the particle is free to move more. Okay. It, it, has, it is typically bounded by this potential, but because the stiffness is bigger, so it's like I have a bigger volume, okay? So the engine is, uh, it's a single particle, it's a single colloidal particle. I first change the volume, then I change the temperature from hot to cold. Then I change the, the stiffness of the parabola back, and then I change again from cold back to hot, okay? That's similar to like a stealing cycle, but you know, <clears throat> There are big differences here. The first one is that this is uh, stochasticity here is very important. While a typical heat engine would be for a system made of many, many molecules, this is a heat engine made by a single colloidal particle, okay? So that's one difference. The other difference is that I can do that at finite time, okay? This is not a quasi-static engine. I can make these steps either slow or fast, depending on the engine I'm dealing with. So for example, this change in temperature they can be pretty fast and uh, you know th this engine is the operates at finite time so 
this is a heat engine that operates at finite time and that can have large fluctuations, okay? And so, you know, this kind of model was proposed in 2008 by Tim Smido and Udo Seifert and, and was realized experimentally for the first time in 2012. Now, lots of people work with that. Edgar worked with that and with experiments and there is theory. So, you know, the idea people had is so let's do heat engines that are small and that operate at finite time. And, you know, since the paper by Udo Seifert and Tim Smido in 2008, there have been lots of work on that, okay? Again, this probably started in 2008, I would say. And, you know, it's a very interesting perspective. It's a heat engine again, but that is small. Just one thing, the, the system is a single colloidal particle and that operates at finite time, okay? Okay, and you know, the features of the engine is the work you do divided by the extracted work, the extracted work divided by the heat you take from the hot reservoir, that must be small decarbon efficient. This bound is true, okay? Okay. 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 So that's all good, but in 2016, uh, these people here proposed a different heat engine. Again, it's the same as the heat engine before. It's a single colloidal particle. It goes from hot to cold, then back from cold to hot. So it's the same kind of cycle. But the difference is that, you know, while before my solution is just a colloidal particle in water, for example, now it's also a colloidal particle in water. But on top of that, they just put a bunch of bacteria in the water. Okay. And now this bacteria is something that you cannot see, but of course they're going to collide with the particle and make huge difference now in the engine. And, you know, if before you can imagine the water as a reservoir, as an equilibrium reservoir, now you can imagine the water plus the bacteria as either an active reservoir or a non equilibrium reservoir, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, this case here, I would call this one as the active heat engine. It's active because I have all this bacteria in the solution. So I have this hidden dissipative degrees of freedom that will make a huge difference to my engine. And why they make a huge difference? So when they did this experiment, one thing they observe is if I do the same protocol, okay, I can do the exact same protocol by that is the exact same change in temperature and energy, okay? But if I do, if I put the bacteria uh, as compared to not having the bacteria, the work and extract can be larger when I have the bacteria. Okay, that's one, one, one observation. So basically, if you have a heat engine in an active heat, active medium that follows the exact same protocol as a heat engine in a passive medium, the heat engine is an active medium, is can extract more work. That's possible. Okay, that's one observation that's interesting. Uh, the other observation they have is that if you look at some sort of efficiency, which I would call pseudo efficiency in this case, which is uh, the extracted work divided by the heat, um, they could get an efficiency that was larger than the Carnot efficiency. So I, I would call this pseudo efficiency. So they could get a pseudo efficiency that was larger than the Carnot efficiency. Now, this heat here is only the heat associated with the colloidal particle, okay? It does not take into account all the energy dissipated by the bacteria. Okay, so, you know, you can look at, at something like this. It's a very interesting perspective. It's a very interesting experiment. You know, the relevance is that, you know, lots of things are, lots of reservoirs are non-equilibrium reservoirs. So, you know, the concept of active matter or or a medium being active, you know, if, if you put, uh, let's say you want something to do something inside our bodies, okay? Let's say I want to put a molecule inside our bodies to do something periodic and complete some task, which could be work extraction, but could be something else. So, you know, of course, if I put uh, a molecule inside our body, it's going to be, it's going to have all these molecular motors walking around and or whatever it's going to have. If it's inside a cell, I don't know. And um, it's probably going to be actually in an active medium, right? That's probably, so, you know, being in an active medium is, can, can be a quite common scenario. So, you know, uh, beyond this experiment, it's a quite interesting question to think about is, is uh, to think about, you know, a heat engine in an active medium, right? But, you know, given these observations that you can extract more work and that the efficiency or the pseudo efficiency can be larger than the kind of efficiency, the very good question to ask, I guess, is what is the appropriate statement of the second law for active heat engines, okay? So that's what we discovered. I mean, it was a question, you know, several theory groups worked on this problem 
on the problem of active heat engines. And but you know, I think nobody before us was really able to answer this question: what's the appropriate saving on second law for an active heat engine? Now, you could say, okay, yeah, I can have uh, efficiency the kind of efficiency. But that's because this heat is not taking the heat of the bacteria into account. And that's true. If you take all the heat dissipated by the bacteria, then you know there is nothing like efficiency larger than the efficiency. That wouldn't make sense. But that's not a very good answer for two reasons. One is that the bacteria are, are these dissipative degrees of freedom in the reservoir. So you don't really have access to them. So if you have a second law that has also includes the dissipation of the bacteria, you would need to have information about the dissipation of the bacteria, which you don't have. Okay, so answering this question by simply including the dissipation of these dissipative degrees of freedom, this these hidden degrees of freedom, is not a very good answer to this question because you want to have a second law that can be measured by only looking at the particle. Okay, is there a second law that applies to the system that tells me what kind of thing, how much work I can extract, or what kind of task this heat engine can accomplish that only contains quantity? That depends on, on, on things that I can calculate by only looking at the particle. Okay. And I mean, another reason you do, want, do not want to include the dissipation because of the bacteria is that this dissipation is very large. Okay. So the work you extract in the engine, which related to changes in this parabola, okay, changing the stiffness of the parabola, is definitely much, much smaller than all the energy the bacteria dissipate. Okay. And if that's true, if I have a second law that includes two quantities, one quantity is much larger than the other, all the second law is going to tell me is that this quantity is much larger, it's going to totally dominate the second law, and this quantity is going to be positive, okay? So, you know, if I was to include the energy dissipated by the bacteria in a second law inequality, all the second law would tell me is that the energy dissipated by the bacteria is positive, because whatever is the work doesn't really matter, because the work is just much smaller than energy dissipated by the bacteria. So, basically, I mean, there is an answer to this question, what's the second law that, you know, most especially would say, okay, just include the energy displayed by the bacteria and you should get a normal second law. That's true, but that's a very unsatisfactory question, answer to this question, because this is information you are not going to have in general. So if you put a system in an active medium, you don't really know about the dissipation of the active medium. And, and you don't really want to express your second law or, you know, if you are asking what's the performance of the engine, you don't want to answer the question about performance of the engine, including quantities that cannot be calculated by simply looking at the position of the particle for this particular model. Okay, so that's kind of what we did. We found this statement on the second law that fulfilled these requirements. Okay, so I can do a much simpler model of the same physics that was there. The model we did was like a true state model. So, you know, I can change the, I can increase the energy of the state, then I change the temperature, then I decrease the energy, and then I change the temperature again. It's similar to the parabola model, but now it's a true state model. And to make the engine active, I put a delta mu inside, okay? This is a little bit different because here I can see all my degrees of freedom. And before I cannot see the degrees of freedom, here I can, but you know, I, I, it doesn't really matter because the second law remains the same. That, that's what I'm gonna argue. But you know, if you do this model here, and the delta mu is the delta mu we saw before. So there are two chemical reactions pathway between these three states. And I put a delta mu there. So if the delta mu is non zero, the engine becomes active. If the delta mu is zero, the engine is passive. And you know, if you do this three state heat engine, which again, it's something you can solve exactly. It's a very simple model. You can pretty much see all the observations from the experiment, which is, you know, uh, the work as you see when you start in the zero x axis, the delta mu is zero. That's a passive heat engine. So the work uh, active heat engine extract can be larger, right? As you can see, this red region is far from, from delta mu equals to zero. So, you know, if I turn on the delta mu, if I make the heat engine active, the extraction of work can be larger. And this blue region here with delta mu and beta, beta H phase in the delta mu beta H phase gamma is a region where the efficiency the pseudo efficiency, which is the work divided by the heat, is larger than the Carnot efficiency. Okay. And I call this pseudo efficiency because the pseudo efficiency. Again, when I talk about heat, I am not including the cost of the delta mu here. I'm just talking about uh, heat that is associated with jumps between the state zero and E. Okay. So, you know, heat would be if I jump from zero to E, I must take a uh, amount of heat E. And if I jump back, it's minus Z and so on and so forth. So the heat I'm talking about is the energy differences 
uh, that comes when I make a jump between the two states, okay? Again, that's very similar to, you know, this tree state model has almost all the ingredients of the experiment. The only ingredient it's not, it does not have is the sort of coarse graining, is the fact that, you know, there are these bacteria I cannot see here. You know, I don't have bacteria, I just have this delta mu and I can always see my tree state. So, you know, there is a little bit of a difference between both models, but most of the physical observations can already be made with this very, very simple model, which I would argue is the simplest model of an active heat engine you can do, okay? So, you know, if we do this very simple model, we can work out everything. And, you know, if I calculate the quantities in this model, I can calculate the work, I can calculate the hot heat, and I can calculate also the delta S active. Now the delta S active is the entropy change associated with um, burning that ATP or that, that, that delta me cycle I had in the figure before. So, you know, whenever I do this cycle here, okay, or this cycle here or this cycle here, I burn an ATP, okay? So delta, delta S active is the entropy production associated with burning ATP in these cycles, okay? So, um, and again, this is entropy change per period, okay? Now I have a period of oscillation or I, but it's not an oscillation like I had before, it's an oscillation that is imposed, right? So I have the period of the heat engine and that's the entropy change per period. So if I look at these quantities, what I see is, uh, you know, I told you that the energy dissipation of the bacteria was much higher in that model, but this can be expressed in a physical way in a way that is more, in a formal way that is a little bit more clear, which is the fact that while the heat and the work, they saturate as I change my period, tau is the period of the heat engine, okay? So if I keep increasing the period, the heat and the work, they saturate, the delta S associated with the, um, with the delta mu there, the, it, it just grows linearly with time, okay? And that's easy to understand because if I keep increasing the period of the heat engine, the work per period is gonna saturate, of course, because the work is related to changes in the in the harmonic potential, but the entropy change because of the delta mu is going to always increase because you know the larger the tau, the more cycles I do between the two states, and so this delta s active just increases linear with tau. So you know, again, that's just to argue that this second law is not a very good one because the delta s active, you know, after a certain tau, it's just going to become much larger, and so it's not something I really want to include in my second law. And the right second law is this one in blue. So the right second law includes this QH, includes the W, and includes an information theoretic term that I'm gonna to try to explain in the next slide. So that's what we found. We found this, this correct second law for an active heat engine, okay? okay. Um, which I think was a very important problem. Um, now, the point is that this right second law comes from something in stochastic thermodynamic called excess entropy. Sometimes people call this non-adiabatic entropy, okay? I prefer the name excess entropy. But you know, both of them for a steady for a periodically driven system are the exact same quantity. In general, they might be different by boundary terms, but for a periodically driven system, the average excess entropy or the average non-diabatic entropy would be the exact same quantity. But in any case, excess entropy is something that you know exists in thermodynamics for for a good amount of time, maybe 20 years or so. And uh, it was invented a long time ago. Now, for a steady state, we, we in, again, in the lectures, we mostly saw steady states. For a steady state, the average excess entropy is just zero, okay? So that's not a quantity we talk too much when we talk about steady states because the average excess entropy is zero. Now, a big interest in excess entropy came from the fact that this excess entropy alone can fulfill fluctuation theorem, okay? So the point I wanna make here is excess entropy is a mathematical quantity that existed in, 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 in stochastic thermodynamics for a long time. It had some physical interpretation, but the fact that it is really the, the, the right quantity to look at when you have a active heat engine is something that we discovered, okay? And if you kind of do a smart decomposition of the excess entropy, you find that it can be expressed in this form. It has the hot heat, it has the work, and it has the I. Now the advantage of this I term, it doesn't have the scaling problem. You see, it doesn't grow linearly with time. It also saturates. And the I term here, if I was to think about the original experiment, is something that I can calculate by only looking at the position of the particle. There is no need to look at the bacteria, okay? Okay, so let me try to explain uh, 
how we do that. So let's say you have a master equation like we had in this course, right? The K is here as substituting the Ws, but now my transition rates, Kij and Kji, they depend on time and they are periodic, okay? With a period tau, which is the period of the engine. If that's true, if I look at the long time solution of this master equation, it's gonna be also periodic. So this is not really a steady state, you could call this a periodic steady state, okay? It's just a long time solution of the equation that will be also periodic, okay? Now, um, I can think about two probability distributions. One is this PI of T, which is really the probability of the system to be a, in state E at time T that is periodic in time and it's the long time solution of this equation, okay? You can do this using Floquet theory if you know what Floquet theory is. But you know, in principle, you can calculate this thing. And the other distribution I would like to think about is the stationary distribution the system would have if I was to freeze my protocol. What does it mean to freeze the protocol? So from the engine I had before, it would simply mean that I fix the energy, I fix the stiffness of the parabola, I fix the temperature, and then I let the system run to a steady state, okay? That's the steady state I would have if I was to stop changing my temperature and energy, okay? And this PST is distribution I would have. Now, if the heat engine is passive, okay, if I don't have the bacteria there, I just have a parabola and that's it, I will go to an equilibrium distribution, okay, which would be just a Gaussian, okay, given by that parabola, basically. If, uh, if I have the bacteria there, then it's more complicated. I'm going to get a stationary distribution, which is not the equilibrium one, okay? So if this this, this thing is sometimes called accompanying density or accompanying distribution. So again, that's the probability distribution I would have if I was to freeze my protocol at that particular time t, okay? So there are these two different distributions. And again, for a heat, for an active heat engine, this PS here is gonna be a non-equilibrium distribution. And for a passive heat engine, this PS is gonna be an equilibrium distribution, okay? Now the PI of t, which is the real probability distribution of the system, is different from the PS, okay? You must, This it's a very important point for that I term I had before. And again, the reason I'm explaining these two distributions is that they are very important for that I term, okay? That I was talking about, okay? So there are two distributions. One is the probability distribution of the system. The other is the probability distribution the system would have in the stationary state if I was to freeze my protocol at that particular time t. All right, so the way you do that is, okay, we talked about generalized state balance. So, you know, in case you never saw it, this is the general form of generalized state balance. General generalized, it's a little bit too much, but you know, that's what this equation is. So I have some beta, I have some delta E, then I have some A alpha, which is the affinity, right? The affinity is what I call delta mu. This Dij is generalized distance. So for example, if the A alpha is the delta mu, the Dij is how much substrat I burn when I make a transition from I to J, okay, for example. So how much ATP I burn. If I don't burn ATP, this Dij is zero. If I burn one ATP, the Dij is one and the Dji would be minus one and so on and so forth, okay? So, you know, if I write my transition rates like that, which is pretty general, you know, the, the transition rates can always be written like that. Uh, and then I calculate my entropy, which is the entropy from stochastic thermodynamics that we saw in this course. I will get this equation here, okay? I can do that. So delta S active is gonna be the active contribution, the contribution associated with this affinity is A alpha. The eta C is the Carnot efficiency. JQ is the heat, is the same as QH, but it's a little bit more general. It would be the case where the temperature is like a periodic function that's not only between hot and cold, but it's a more general periodic function, but though that's the heat you take from the hot reservoir and that's the work you extract, okay? Okay, so that's the normal entropy. It will have this term. If I do the excess entropy, which is defined by this equation here, I can show that it can be written like this, okay? That's something you have to demonstrate. That's more, more. that's just definition. It's not so hard to do. It takes a lot of thinking to figure things out, but you know, once you figure it out mathematically, it's pretty straightforward. But that's the general form of the excess entropy. Now, everything I'm talking about here, these second laws we have are extremely general, okay? The only assumption I have to make is that at some level of description, the system must be Markovian. So, you know, if you think about the experiment that I had, which was a colloidal particle with a bunch of bacteria, if I only look at the colloidal particle, the dynamics of the colloidal particle is gonna be no Markovian actually, okay? Now, if I look at the Markov process, which is the colloidal particle plus the bacteria, 
if I would imagine that, then at that level description, things are going to be Markovian, okay? So the only requirement that uh, we need for this theory we have to work is that at some level of description, when you include also the hidden degrees of freedom of the reservoir, your description, the system has to be Markovian, okay? That's pretty much it. And that should be true for most active heat engines, okay? or for pretty much all of them, if you're thinking about biological systems or something like that. Okay. Um, I came back. Okay, so, you know, I got this term. Let me try to explain what the I term is, okay? So the I term is, can, can be defined in this way. So that's the definition of I. Now, uh, you know, if I write this equation, a length of PS, remember PS is the stationary state, is the stationary distribution I would have if I was to freeze my protocol at time T and P equilibrium is the stationary state I would have if it's a passive heat engine, okay? If it's active, then this PS is gonna be non-equilibrium. So if I write down this quantity, it can be written like this. It's gonna, it can be written as the kubek Leiber distance between the probability P, which is a real probability distribution of the system and the equilibrium distribution, minus the kubek Leiber of P and the non-equilibrium stationary state distribution an active engine has. If, this, if, if the heat engine is passive, okay, this I is equal to zero. So I would have P equilibrium, my stationary state is also the equilibrium one and I just get zero here, okay? If I take a time derivative of this quantity, which is this kubek Leiber different uh, distance, then uh, I get this result. And you know what I can see here is that this is the I I wrote there before, but this thing here must be zero because the system is periodic, okay? This derivative of a function that's periodic, when I integrate the derivative of a function that's periodic, I'm gonna get zero. <laughs> And so because this thing is zero, I can get this equality, okay? That's kind of hard to understand. But, but the point is that the I thing is part of the time derivative of this quantity here, okay? The kubek Leiber distance between P and P equilibrium and P and PS, okay? That's kind of an information theoretic interpretation of the term I. Okay, so that's the I term. And so, I mean, uh, What's the physical interpretation of this thing, okay? The physical interpretation is the following. So if I look at the, uh, okay. If I look at the passive, an active heat engine, it has this extra term I here, okay? And that is the term that quantifies, I mean, first question you should ask yourself is why can a pass, can an active heat engine extract more work than a passive heat engine? Well, the reason that can happen is that because of the active degrees of freedom, your active heat engine has a different probability distribution as compared to the passive one. Right? So if you put all these degrees of freedom, you shift your probability distribution. It doesn't really matter how much energy your degrees of freedom dissipation. What really matters is how you shift your probability distribution. And this term I here quantifies the shift in the probability distribution that is active, uh, active degrees of freedom generate, okay? So I mean, whether my active degrees of freedom generate a lot, dissipate a lot of energy or not, it does not really matter. What is really, really important is that they shift the distribution in the right way. And so if I include this I term in my second law, then I, I can explain everything. I can explain why the efficiency can be larger than the, or the pseudo efficiency can be larger than the kind of efficiency and so on and so forth, okay? So that's kind of the physical interpretation of this thing. Again, understand these things in a detailed manner takes some time, okay? It's a little bit technical. There is the issue of coarse graining, which I'm not gonna talk a lot about, but you know, uh, I am defining things without coarse graining, but if you think about the original experiment, the variable X, which is the position of the particle, uh, is a coarse grained variable. The important point is if I do coarse graining, if I only look at the dynamics of X, which is gonna be no Markovian, that's the dynamic of the particles. So in this notation here, I is equal to XA, okay? That's the full state of the system. X would be the position of the particle and A would determine the state of all bacteria in the solution, okay? Which again, is just a theoretical concept. I don't really have to know those to apply the thing. But if I do the coarse graining, what turns out that the second law that I had before retains the exact same structure, which means that I can do that even for that experiment. And I can measure all, this, all these things, W, J, Q, and this I, by only looking at the position of the colloidal particle. There is no need to look at the state of the bacteria, okay? To calculate the quantities that show up in this, in our second law. 
Okay, so you know we also did uh, we did several models. So this graph here that illustrates that you know while the pseudo efficiency can be larger than the Carnot efficiency, if I do the correct efficiency, which is this one, that also incorporates the I term. So basically, an active heat engine can use two different resources to extract work. One is the heat, and the other is this I term. Okay, which is about how I shift my probability distribution. Um, but basically, you know, if you do the efficiency, it's always bounded by the Carnot efficiency, represented by this black line. So the, the blue line is the real efficiency, and the red one is the pseudo efficiency. And again, this is for a numerical model for a 2D study, which is inspired by the experiment. Okay? Uh, and this has been published recently. So that's the paper. And here, with this slide, I finish. My talk, so I told you two different stories. One is that, you know, if you want to have n coherent oscillations, you must dissipate four pi square multiplied by n. And the other one is that, you know, there are active heat engines. The first experiment was 2016. And, and, and I'm talking about periodically driven heat engines. And we now know what's the appropriate statement of the second law. And the point there is it doesn't really matter how much energy dissipate. What really matters is the way you shift the probability distribution as quantified by this information theoretic term I called I in this talk. Okay, thank you for your time and I'm happy to get questions. Thank you, Professor. Are there any questions from the in-face audience? Yes, please approach. Yes, yes, approach the microphone. Thank you. Uh, hello, Andre, can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we were discussing a lot in this school about maybe your first in in the first lecture that you gave. Like you had one one of the postulates of all this framework was that if you have like a, a transition at W from I to J, you had to have the the reverse transition. No. Yeah. And I, I, we were wondering about if there are extensions of this framework without having that particular postulate, like processes that are in inherently out of equilibrium, I would say. Well, that I mean- Microscopically irreversible. I mean, that, yeah, the, there, are, there are Markov process with reversible transition rates that allow for a physical interpretation and they do allow, I mean, but they have, they have to go a little bit beyond what, what I was talking in the lecture, but there are Markov process which have transition, where the reverse transition rates are zero they allow for a certain kind of interpretation that will fall within the stochastic thermodynamics. But I mean, if you are just thinking about standard stochastic thermodynamics, let's say, if for example, IJ is a chemical reaction, okay, there must be a reversal chemical reaction. It's never zero. It's gonna be, it could be very small, the chance, but if you are thinking about going from I to J is a chemical reaction, or if it's a colloidal particle jumping, there must be a, a there must be a reverse reaction. Like if the colloidal particle because of thermal fluctuations can go from left to right, then it must be able from also going from right to left. And the same thing is true for a chemical reaction. So, I mean, again, if you know, I mean, there are lots of Markov processes and and there are lots of things in stochastic thermodynamics. So there are cases where, uh, where you can get here. Well, for, let's imagine one thing. For example, I worked with stochastic protocols, okay? Let's imagine this external protocol, you have this stochastic and it's jumping. So a stochastic protocol is something that could have irreversible transition rates. It's something you control from the outside and you could control from the outside in such a way that I only have transition rates in a certain direction, okay? So for example, I have worked with that and that's true and, and you know, and that, that you can do stochastic thermodynamics and there are irreversible transition rates there or transition rates for which there is no, there is no coming back, but, for the standard, let's say, stochastic thermodynamics, if we're just thinking about states and, you know, it's the state of a colloidal particle, the state of a chemical reaction, there must be a reversible transition rate. I mean, otherwise it doesn't, I mean, you know, I, I don't know any example of a chemical reaction that there is no reverse or a colloidal particle that only jumps to the right. I mean, the thermal fluctuation will also put you to the left, even if the drive is very strong. So, yeah, I mean, there are, it is possible to have Markov process that have, Irreversible transition rates, and you know, these are Markov processes that will allow for some sort of interpretation with stochastic thermodynamics. But for the standard framework, you know, there must be a reversible transition rate. It's not. It's not really like we impose it because it's mathematically pleasant, and 
you know, now it's mathematically easier to deal with this thing. It's more, it's more a physical thing. I mean, if, if there is a chemical reaction, then there must be a reversed one. If the particle jumps to the right, then it must be able to jump to the left, okay? Okay, but for example, I mean, you can think on thermal engines, like for example, a, a bird, you know, it is flying and for sure there is an energy consumption there and it's a thermodynamic machine kind of, but it's not in a thermal bath. I mean, could you apply this kind of, there is something similar to this framework that you can apply for those systems? A bird? What was the example of the bird? The bird is flying? Yes, like, I mean, there are a lot of uh, works now on collective behavior and collective behavior in active matter. So sure, I mean... The block the, the, of birds, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, the problem is with the word active here. I think the word active is a bit... So this word active is used for a lot of stuff, which I think are not, I mean, the word active does not have a clear meaning in the sense of there is an equation, at least in the context of my talk it has, but in general, when people say active, it's kind of hard to define it with an equation. It's not like non-equilibrium. Non-equilibrium means entropy production. Entropy production is zero, it's equilibrium. Entropy production is not zero, it's non-equilibrium. Active does not have a similar mathematical definition. And that's a bit of the danger of the world. But you know, if you think about birds, it's it's hard to think about that. If you think about a flock of birds, okay, it would be hard to think about that as a thermodynamic system. There is nothing there. I mean, it's even hard to think about an entropy production and think about an engine. I mean, uh, what would the birds do? They would fly together, and, and of course, the bird alone. If you think about a single bird, then probably yes, you can you can do. You could do thermodynamics of that. All it would be very complicated, but a flock of birds is a, you know, it would be hard to even think about the concepts of thermodynamics there. I guess. It's, I mean, you know, what is the temp or, or I mean, what would they do? They would move together and do a heat. That would be strange. But uh, I would say if you think about a bird alone, maybe. And and so you know, if you want to think about this physically, I mean. Imagine put something inside your human body and, and trying to complete a task, okay? Imagine put a molecule inside the human body and then there will be lots of stuff going on in the human body and so on and so forth. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of my answer, which I don't know if it's totally satisfactory, but that's what I have. But I'm, I'm happy to, if you want to rephrase the question, and in, my, if, in case my answer was not satisfactory, I'm happy to try to improve. No, okay, I, I'm, I'm kind of happy, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I see that there are some questions from in the chat room, chat box. Okay. So. What do you mean by the relation between information? No, that was from Juan, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. What's the effective temperature of the active? Yeah, so, you know, effective concerning effective temperature, I should say that effective temperature is not something that I love. Uh, <laughs> the, whole, the whole point of doing this theory was to really avoid effective temperature. Uh, the problem with effective temperature, it's, it, 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 it's something that you can define in different ways, and it's always something that is not applied to, I mean, it applies to a particular model or a particular class of models. So the whole point of doing this thing that we did was to, because the temperatures we have when we write down the second law are bona fide temperatures, okay? They're real temperatures, that is just the temperature of the reservoir. And in, within our description, we can completely avoid effective temperatures and never talk about them. They are not necessary because we can have a framework that have the real temperature of the reservoir, the hot one and the cold one. So kind of our framework is much more general than that. So it applies to pretty much everything. You could have a single colloidal part. You could have a system that has interactions and it's not necessary to talk about this. Concept. Now, you know, depending on the model, like the model we did, one could define effective temperature by either, by either looking the, you know, the mean square of the displacement of the particle, something like that. That's something we could do, but it's, you know, the whole point of our kind of our framework, or not the whole point, but the main point is that we can kind of, we don't need to talk about effective temperature, okay? Uh, Thank you, Professor. Any more? No, oh, oh, sorry, there is one more, sorry, from the person uh, hi, I was just wondering, what if you start to manipulate the activity of the uh, of the active medium? Will that affect this law? Yes, like, because yeah, I mean, if you want to say something else? No, yeah, I just thought maybe in a way that didn't follow the protocol of the rest of the yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, yes, and, and okay, so what, I mean, what our second law tells is that what really, really matters is the way you shift the probability distribution. So if you change this activity, you change the shift in the distribution, okay? Well, how exactly, okay, depends on the model, but we do have the right, the term that 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 quantifies the, the shift in distribution. So, you know, yeah, if you if you change the activity, you're gonna change the shift in distribution as quantified by the term I, and then you change the second law, and then you might be able to do more work or, or something else. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, yes. Now the BEF is at non-equilibrium temperature is not well defined. So yeah, the BEF, this is true and not true what you're saying. So, I mean, the, the, I mean, uh, one reason why I don't like this name of non-equilibrium reservoir or 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 active reservoir, it's it's a nice name, but you have to be a bit careful there because, you know, this is this is just a method of coarse graining, in the sense that let, let's think about the experiment. If I only look at the particle, then it's no Markovian and it's a non-equilibrium bath. But if I was to take the particle plus the bacteria as my system, even if I cannot really do that, I mean, if, if even if in practice I cannot see this position of the bacteria, but at least theoretically I can imagine I can do that. Then the bath is an equilibrium bath and there is a well-defined temperature, okay? So this thing of an active bath, at least when I think about like biological system, it's more a matter of coarse graining. By that, I mean, if I, if I, if I was to think of the particle plus the bacteria as my system, then it's an equilibrium bath. So when I say the temperature, the temperature is what I get when I also include the dissipative degrees of the reservoir as part of my system, and then I would have an equilibrium heat bath. And then if I start with this description, I can simply do a coarse graining and look only at the position of the particle. And in this case, I will have a well-defined temperature. I hope that answers your question, Kumar. I have a related question. Yeah. Okay, please, please be quick because we, we have a yeah. the 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 bacteria the, the 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 medium can be also small system like engine itself. The I mean the bacteria the, I could just have one bacteria that would be fine, but the medium the 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 the, the solution where I am. So when when I when I think about this full description where I also included the, so the number of dissipative degrees of freedom that make my bath active can be small. That's fine. But the bath per se, when so if I think about the description where I also include the CPC with the freedom, the bath per se must be something big and uh, an equilibrium thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, Andre. It's really a pleasure to have you even online. Uh, he has been teaching at 5 a.m. in Houston, so we should. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yes. A big <laughs> applause to yes. Andre. Yes.